In this haunting video, we explore two of the most disturbing stories in American criminal history. First, we delve into the chilling tale of James Godwin, a loner with a troubled past who terrorized a small town with a string of brutal murders. Despite years of investigation, Godwin managed to evade capture until he was finally brought to justice. Next, we turn our attention to the infamous sex slave killers, Gerald and Charlene Gallego, who abducted, tortured, and murdered young women in California in the 1970s. Together, they committed some of the most heinous crimes in American history, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. Join us as we explore the dark and twisted stories of these three individuals and uncover the shocking details of their crimes. From the depths of depravity to the heights of horror. James Edward Wood One of the major tragedies of his young life came when he was just eight years old, that is when his mother died. While saving two other workers from a fire in a potato shed where she worked Hazel burned to death. Worse yet, James saw the entire thing happen. Understandably in distress the thin Godwin reached out and clung to a nearby woman looking to be comforted. Instead of the support he was in desperate need of at that moment, she pushed him away from her. The reaction wasn't what the little boy had hoped for and he would later claim was the thing that caused him to develop a general hatred of women. He went on further to say that if someone was to have the general appearance of the woman who'd brushed him off he'd become greatly agitated, something that he again claimed plagued him his entire life. After the tragic loss of his mother, he was adopted by an aunt and uncle. They also have his name legally changed to James Edward Wood. Here he suffered what he called severe physical and emotional abuse at their hands. He was known to lash out a lot and eventually the couple decided it was beyond their ability to control the youth. They shipped him off to the Idaho Youth Training Center located in St. Anthony, Idaho and hoped someone else could get a handle on the aggressive behavior. It isn't until 1963 when his father is released from prison that he is able to escape the state. His father offers to let him live with him back in Shreveport, Louisiana which he happily agrees to. The arrangement lasts for three years when in 1966 he moves to Missouri and joins flight school. This is where Wood marries what would be his first wife and also he alleges when he began raping women in Missouri and Illinois. His marriage falls apart and in 1967 he moves into his brother's house in Bossier City. Soon afterward he breaks into an apartment where he stabs two women and attempts to rape one of them. He is quickly arrested and incarcerated at the Bossier Parish Jail on the charge of aggravated battery. While he waits to stand trial he is badly injured by his cellmate when what steals the man's blanket. In retaliation for this, the man ignites a cup of lighter fluid and throws it on him. He is convicted on the charges and subsequently is sentenced to 10 years in prison although he is eventually paroled early for good behavior on August 18, 1971, after serving less than half that time. After his release Wood takes a job as a truck driver but he hasn't put away his criminal ways. During the mid to late 70s, James and his brother commit various robberies across the states of Louisiana, Texas and Arkansas. It isn't until 1977 when he's arrested again for robbing a pizzeria in Baton Rouge does he face any criminal charges. Regardless of his checkered past though he bails out and moves to the northern part of the state. After the resettlement process is complete, Wigan finds himself as a truck driver, this time for an oil company. He also marries his second wife, but like the first time, his son arrested for the rape of a woman in Lincoln Park. His incarceration lasts until November 8, 1986. Less than a year after his now second release from prison he marries a woman named Yvonne and two years later they welcome a child to the world. During the years of 1986 through 1992, no crimes can be tied to James Wood, whether this be he remained a law-abiding citizen or more likely he was never caught as unknown. Eventually, he moves to a city by the name of Grand Cane but has to leave town quickly when a 14-year-old relative of his wife claims that he raped her at one of the places he worked at. Wood decides to make a clean break and move in with a cousin of his that lives in the town of Chubbuck, Idaho. On his drive there James passes through a suburban part of St. Louis where he kidnaps a then 18-year-old Jamie Mazingale. After taking her to a nearby forest he rapes her and shoots her in the back of the head. Amazingly the teen survives the bullet wound. After the assault, 
James continues on and arrives in Idaho on November 1st. Idaho doesn't have to wait long before Wood's evil shows up within its borders. On June 29, 1993, while on her newspaper route, an 11-year-old Geralee Underwood is lured by James into his car. As soon as she gets in he pulls out a gun and kidnaps the youth. Despite her young age Wood doesn't show the girl mercy and shoots her in the back of the head with a .22 caliber revolver. For more than a week he repeatedly rapes the corpse before finally dismembering the body and dumping the parts into the Snake River where it is found eight days later by search crews. The small community doesn't have to wait long before they have an arrest. On July 7th, Officer Scott Shaw takes Wood into custody where he readily admits his guilt with respect to Underwood's murder along with two other rapes and several robberies he's committed since murdering Jara Lee. Due to the heinous nature and number of crimes a total of 12 charges are levied against him including first-degree murder, kidnapping, and rape. To his surprise, the recent crimes aren't the only ones that Wood admits to committing. He also tells Officer Shaw about the murder of a woman named Shirley Coleman that he committed back in 1976 in Greenwood, Louisiana. 33 years old at the time of her abduction Wood claimed he took her while she was in a parking lot while shopping for Christmas presents. Wood tells the officers that he drove her to the General Electrical Industrial Plant where he raped her in the back of her car before shooting her in the back of her head. Her remains wouldn't be recovered for another five years. Numerous other cases where similar situations had occurred in the areas and times when Wood had lived throughout his life, but due to a lack of connecting evidence or further confessions no other charges were filed against him. While at court Wood pleads guilty to Underwood's murder despite his attorneys advising him otherwise. Upon his admittance of guilt, the judge over the case sentenced him to death. It only took a few weeks after the sentencing hearing before James files papers with the court waiving all further appeals in an attempt to speed up the execution process although he would eventually pull this motion after being convinced by his lawyers. James Wood did eventually appeal his case on the grounds of ineffective assistance of the counsel. His attorneys claimed that Wood had been convinced by one of the previous lawyers who had represented him that he could find atonement through blood, or in his case, death. In the end, though the judge denied his appeal and held up his death sentence. Although he was sentenced to be executed James Wood met his end on February 1, 2004. Doctors say the man died of what was called natural causes after complaining of breathing problems earlier in the day while incarcerated on death row at the Idaho Maximum Security Institute. He was 56. Here our first story ends. Before moving on to the second story. Subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed. Gerald and Charlene Gallego When 31-year-old Gerald Armand Gallego walked into a Sacramento poker club in September of 1977 and laid eyes on a petite blonde named Charlene Williams, he was instantly smitten. Ten years his junior, she looked like a schoolgirl which made her all the more alluring. Although they seemed as different as night and day, the horrifying truth of just how alike they were would surface soon enough, leaving a trail of death and destruction that spanned three states. Some would say that Gerald's life path had been paved from birth. With a mother who prostituted herself to make ends meet and a father who had the distinction of being the first man put to death in Mississippi's gas chamber, few could argue that their offspring had the cards stacked against him. While there are those who have survived worse and flourished, Gerald decided early on to not only overlook his parents' misdeeds, but to put everything he had into doing them one better. Gerald's first brush with the law came at the age of 13 when he was accused of sexually assaulting a six-year-old girl. Since he was only a child himself, he got off with a slap on the wrist. In the coming years, he would be arrested 23 times, seven of which resulted in felony convictions. Despite his obvious inability to abide by society's rules, the legal system's revolving doors allowed him to walk free time and again. Handsome in an unconventional sort of way, Gerald never lacked for female companionship. By the age of 30, he had already been married six times. On at least one occasion he had been so eager to tie the knot that he had neglected to inform his current wife of his plans. As a result, he was able to add polygamy to his ever-growing list of offenses. Though Gerald had many dark sides to his personality, his unnatural attraction to extremely young girls was among the worst. When his daughter Krista was born in 1964, 
he had viewed her not as a precious gift, but as an object of desire. By the time she turned six, he was molesting her on a regular basis. It would be years before she found the strength to put an end to the abuse once and for all. Unlike her future husband, Charlene Williams had been brought up by loving parents who handed her the world on a silver platter. A quiet child who did well in school, she had walked the straight and narrow until her teen years when drugs and alcohol made her nearly unrecognizable as the girl she used to be. In an attempt to break up the monotony of her humdrum existence, she had married and divorced twice by the time she turned 20. She ultimately met her match in Gerald, who would change her life in ways even she couldn't have foreseen. A few months into their relationship, cracks were already beginning to show. As far as Gerald was concerned, the biggest obstacle to their happiness was Charlene's inability to satisfy his needs. Slowly but surely, she learned what his previous partners already knew, namely that he had trouble being aroused by grown women. In an effort to appease him, she had shaved off her body hair and encouraged him to call her Krista during sex. All this worked for a while, he eventually grew tired of playing pretend. It became clear to both of them at that point that a poor substitute would no longer do. On July 17, 1978, with Charlene's blessing, Gerald had celebrated his 32nd birthday by sodomizing his 14-year-old daughter. Two months later, she would muster up the courage to tell authorities that her father had been sexually abusing her for years. After seeing how the disturbing incident had bolstered his spirits, Charlene instigated a threesome by picking up a teenage girl she thought would be a suitable stand-in for Krista. The plan backfired when the sight of his girlfriend in a passionate embrace with a stranger had rendered Gerald impotent. After discussing what went wrong, the couple decided that the only solution was to find girls who meant nothing to them to use and do away with when they had their fill. They agreed that this was the only way to ensure that no emotional attachments were formed. On September 11, 1978, a pregnant Charlene scouted a mall in Sacramento in search of potential victims. When she spied 17-year-old Rhonda Scheffler and 16-year-old Kippy Vaught, she knew she had found her marks. After approaching the pair and asking if they wanted to smoke some pot, she had convinced them to follow her outside. When they reached the van, instead of the party they were expecting, Gerald had jumped out and forced them into the cargo space at gunpoint. Over the next several hours, he repeatedly raped the teenagers while Charlene drove. At one point, the warring couple had gotten into a heated argument that prompted her to pull over to the side of the road. They had been in such a hurry to continue their screaming match in a nearby clearing that they had forgotten that the girls were still inside. It was only when they noticed the doors standing wide open that the panic set in. Thinking that their captives had escaped, they had rushed back to the van only to find the girls exactly where they left them, seemingly oblivious to their surroundings. Unaware of the danger they were in, they had trusted that their abductors would let them go. Sadly, it was not to be. After sexually assaulting them throughout the night, Gerald had marched the girls, one at a time, into a field and shot them execution style in the back of the head. Though they had their differences, the partners in crime agreed that the exhilaration of sharing in the rapes and murders had brought them closer together. Still riding the high, the couple married on September 30, 1978. Three weeks after the nuptials, Gerald learned that his daughter Krista had filed a complaint against him with local authorities for incest, sodomy and rape. Infuriated at what he viewed as the ultimate betrayal, he had ordered Charlene to have an abortion. The way he saw it, the last thing he needed was another kid. With their luck on a downturn, the couple laid low until June of 1979 when Gerald's desires began to take over once again. This time, Charlene went trolling for prey at a county fair in Reno, Nevada. As she scanned the crowd, she zeroed in on 14-year-old Brenda Judd and her friend Sandra Colley, who had just turned 13. After making small talk with the girls, Charlene had asked if they would be interested in making some money handing out flyers. Perpetually broke, the pair had jumped at the chance. When they went to the van to collect the papers, they were greeted by Gerald who pulled them inside and locked the doors. Multiple sexual assaults would follow, perpetrated by both of the Gallegos. After abusing the teenagers in every way imaginable, Gerald had bludgeoned them to death with a shovel. Officially listed as runaways, 
it would be four years before anyone learned their fate. On April 24, 1980, the couple abducted Stacy and Radikin and Karen Chipman Twigs, both 17, from the same Sacramento mall they had stalked previously. After suffering countless indignities, they had died by Gerald's hand. Their badly decomposed bodies were recovered from a wooded area three months later. In June, while hiding out in Oregon to avoid process servers, the Gallegos picked up a 21-year-old hitchhiker and expectant mother named Linda Teresa Aguilar. Even though Gerald had initially been captivated by her beauty, when the time came to act on his impulses, her pregnant belly had turned him off. Following a half-hearted rape attempt, he had beaten and strangled her to death before interring her in a shallow grave in the town of Gold Beach. When her body was unearthed, an autopsy showed that her lungs were filled with dirt, indicating that she had been buried alive. Victim number seven was 34-year-old Virginia Machel. On July 17, 1980, shortly after returning to California, the Gallegos had seen the pretty blonde tending bar at a tavern outside Sacramento. After waiting in the parking lot until last call, they had descended upon their target as she was locking up for the night. With the intentions of keeping her for an extended period, the couple had taken her to their apartment where they removed her clothes and tied her up in the living room. Over the next several days, they tortured, raped and humiliated the young mother at their convenience. Her suffering had been so great that she had begged Gerald several times during the ordeal to get it over with and kill her. When he mocked her pleas, she had asked how he expected her to go on living after what he had done to her. Incapable of sympathy, he had dragged the process out for as long as possible before strangling her to death. Three months later, her body was discovered floating in a canal, a cord wrapped tightly around her neck. Getting bolder and more careless with each passing day, the murderous pair's next move would prove to be their undoing. At one o'clock in the morning on November 1, 1980, while driving past a parking lot filled with students leaving a frat party, Gerald had caught a glimpse of 21-year-old Mary Beth Sowers. Exactly his type, he had pulled out a gun and abducted her and her fiancé, 22-year-old Craig Miller, in front of a crowd of stunned onlookers, including an incredulous Charlene. When they reached Base Lake, a stone's throw from Yosemite National Park, Gerald shot Miller and tossed his body out of the car. Even though Charlene had been against the idea, she agreed to take Sowers to their apartment where she was raped repeatedly. Rather than killing her in their home, they had driven her to a secluded area in Placer County where Gerald shot her three times in the back of the head. Just as Charlene had feared, guests at the frat party had jotted down their license plate number as they sped from the scene. After flying under the radar for a little over two weeks, the couple were apprehended on November 17, 1980, when they attempted to pick up a wire transfer at Western Union. When apprised of the allegations against him, Gerald had pleaded not guilty on the charges of kidnapping and murdering Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller. A pregnant Charlene, knowing full well that it was time to abandon ship, agreed to a 16-year prison term in exchange for testifying against her spouse in a court of law. Thanks to his wife's vivid recollections of their savagery, a jury found Gerald guilty as charged and sentenced him to death for the murders of Sowers and Miller. A year later, he received another death sentence in Nevada for killing Stacy Ann Radikin and Karen Chipman Twigs. Unfortunately, the verdict was overturned in 1997. On January 1, 1981, an incarcerated Charlene gave birth to a son, Gerald Armand Gallego Jr., who would go on to be raised by her parents. Hopefully, they did a better job the second time around. Upon completion of her sentence, Charlene was released in July of 1997. In the years to come, she would take every opportunity to declare her innocence. According to her, if she hadn't gone along, her name would have been added to her former husband's long list of victims. Although she and she alone had lured most of the girls to their deaths, she refused to take responsibility for her actions. She also glossed over the fact that she had been a willing participant in more than one rape. It was only when the excitement wore off and the reality of prison set in that she distanced herself from the crimes to which she had been party. Gerald Gallego died in prison on July 18, 2002 after a bout with rectal cancer. This time around, he got the birthday present he deserved. 
Ahu's obsession with his own daughter probably fed his compulsion to sexually assault young girls, he had shown signs of deviant behavior long before she was born. Though he had been detained for sexual misconduct as a teenager, authorities hadn't realized at the time that he was simply testing the waters for atrocities yet to come. The stories of James Godwin and the Gallego sex slave killers are some of the most chilling in American criminal history. These individuals inflicted unimaginable pain and suffering on their victims and their families. As we conclude this video, we remember the victims and hope that their stories serve as a reminder of the need for justice and vigilance. Thank you for watching, and please share this video to help raise awareness of these crimes.